This is Dr. Vermilio. In this lecture, we'll discuss uh, physiological measures. In particular, we're going to discuss otoacoustic emissions and the auditory brainstem response. Otoacoustic emissions. Oto is ear, of course. Uh, acoustic sound emissions. This is the sound that comes out of the ear. This is the sound that goes out of the ear, which sounds absolutely ridiculous. It's like the eye shooting out light, but this is the sound that the ear makes that may be detected in the ear canal if you have the right equipment. Otoacoustic emissions, or OAEs, are low-level acoustic vibrations measured in the ear canal with a sensitive microphone. They were discovered by David Kemp in England in 1978, or that's the paper that he reported. Excuse me. I understand that he... Uh, he had a hard time getting this paper published because people didn't believe that there were sounds that the ear was making. Uh, William Brownell in 1983 reported on the motility or the motion of the outer hair cells. Um, and OAEs are a recording of the movement of outer hair cells. So remember from your... Uh, Anatomy and Physiology Lectures in Hearing Science, outer hair cells uh, have this ability to move. They contract and expand in response to sound if they're healthy. And this motion enhances the motion, the motion of the outer hair cells enhances the motion of the basilar membrane and makes the inner ear sensitive to low-level sounds for normal auditory systems. So, Otoacoustic emissions travel along the basilar membrane through the middle ear ossicles and vibrate the tympanic membrane, which vibrates the air in the external ear canal. OAE amplitudes are typically uh, very low, minus 10 to 20 dB SPL. Background noise in the ear canal must be reduced in order to reveal the otoacoustic emissions. Something uh, called signal averaging is used to, to do this. It is the process used to reduce the unwanted background acoustic no noise in the ear canal. And otoacoustic emissions, emissions reflect preneural, that is before the eighth nerve uh, events. Okay? OAEs may be used to determine if a sensory neural hearing loss is due to a problem in the cochlea or in the neural pathway. Uh, for example, a sensory neural hearing loss, you know, we look at an audiogram, we determine that we, the patient has a sensory neural hearing loss, and if we see that the, we have normal otoacoustic emissions, this would suggest a problem uh, that the, it, this would suggest that the cochlea probably is normal, but the problem is in the eighth nerve or in the central auditory pathways. A problem with the outer or middle ear may interfere with the outward transmission of the OAEs. Uh, generally, otoacoustic emissions are evoked, which means the sound is placed, presented to the, in, in the, into the ear canal, and that's how we elicit or evoke a response from the outer hair cells. That's called an evoked otoacoustic emission. And because of this, because we're putting sound in the ear, uh, in, in most, most, for most, to, uh, most of the OAE measures, uh, a problem with the outer ear or the middle ear may reduce the inward transmission of the uh, test sound, which will affect our OAE measurements. Signal averaging is a signal processing technique applied in the time domain intended to d increase the strength of a signal uh, relative to noise that is obscuring it. By averaging a set of replicate measurements, the signal-to-noise ratio, S slash N or SNR, will be increased, ideally in proportion to the square root of the number of measurements. All that means is this. Imagine uh, we're, we're taking, we have a microphone inside the ear canal, and we're, we're measuring the, the sound in the ear canal. We're not putting any sound in. We're just measuring the noise in, inside the ear canal. Even in a very quiet test booth, we can put a microphone inside the ear canal and we can measure some sort of noise. It's called the noise floor. Now, picture this. We, now we play a signal inside the ear canal. Everything is healthy. The outer hair cells respond. They vibrate. 
uh, the vibrations cause the fluid to vibrate, vibrate causes the stapes foot plate to vibrate, causes the ossicular chain to vibrate, it causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate, and it causes the uh, air molecules within the external ear canal to vibrate. And this way we can uh, get the sound from the outer hair cells into the external ear canal. But inside the external ear canal we also have noise, just, just you know, biologic noise, the noise floor of the room, etc. And the level or the amplitude of the otoacoustic emissions is really small, it's very, very low. So we need to average, do the signal averaging in order to, to detect that. And noise, uh, by its nature, is random in amplitude. So if we look at one frequency, we look at one frequency region, we measure the noise at this moment in time, and we see, okay, the amplitude is uh, 30 dB SPL. Now we measure the noise the next moment in time, we find out that it's, oh, it's 5 dB SPL. We do it again. We average the amplitude, it's 25 dB SPL. We do it again, we see that the noise uh, floor at that frequency region is actually uh, minus 3 dB signals noise ratio. So we keep doing this over and over again. We average the amplitudes, and over time the amplitude of the noise, or the amplitude of the, <coughs> the sound that we're measuring, <coughs> excuse me, at that frequency uh, region will decrease. And uh, the goal is to get it to de decrease below the level of the autoacoustic emission. Once it does that, we can actually measure the amplitude of the autoacoustic emission. So again, we have to use signal averaging to see or to measure the very low level autoacoustic emission. Without the utilization of signal averaging, the target signal may be impossible to measure due to the presence of noise. For OAE measurements, the noise is acoustic noise found in the patient's ear canal. Now here is one type of evoked autoacoustic em emission, and this is a transient evoked autoacoustic emission. A transient is another name for a click. It's a very, very brief sound. So transient evoked autoacoustic emissions, or TEOAEs, are evoked by the presentation of a series of brief transients, or clicks. Clicks have a broad uh, frequency spectrum and stimulate a wide portion of the basilar membrane from low frequencies to high frequencies. TEOAEs are recorded during the short silent intervals between successive clicks and occur with a characteristic time delay or latency after each click. So imagine uh, we play a click in the ear canal and then we measure the amplitude of sound over time in the ear canal. We play another click, measure the amplitude of sound over time in the ear canal and we average the amplitude um, across time for each of the, of the frequency uh, regions uh, from the click. Okay, latency period of the TEOAE components uh, is generally between uh, 5 to 15 milliseconds. So here's a little cartoon. We have this probe tip that goes in the ear uh, it's connected to a speaker, so we're going to deliver a sound into the ear. Uh, there's also a microphone attached, so it, uh, the sound inside the ear canal, we're going to measure that. So we're presenting sound, we're measuring sound. We're not going to change pressure. This is not a tym uh, tympanogram. We're not changing pressure in the ear canal. Uh, and then we have this, uh, the signal for the microphone will be uh, routed to a, a signal averager. The computer will also uh, present the signal for the clicks to the speaker. So we have clicks in and then uh, the air, air space or the uh, air molecules in the ear canal will vibrate, the TM will vibrate, the ossicular chain vibrates, the stapes foot plate vibrates if everything is healthy, and then the fluid uh, vibrates inside the, uh, the, the cochlea, this is supposed to be the basal membrane, and then the outer hair cells, if they're functioning normally, will uh, expand and contract jump up and down, if you will, the basal membrane will vibrate, the fluid will vibrate, uh, the stapes foot plate is now vibrating uh, due to the vibrations uh, delivered from the outer hair cells, the uh, ossicular chain vibrates, the, ear can the eardrum vibrates, and then the airspace inside the ear canal will vibrate, and so now we're going to measure that sound. So there's a click, click, it goes inside the ear, and then it vibrates the basilar membrane. 
if the outer hair cells are functioning normally, they will vibrate and the vibrations go this way and then they're measured and uh, all the amplitudes are averaged after each successive click. And you can have, you know, literally thousands of clicks being presented to uh, elicit the uh, motion or the vibrations from the outer hair cells. So this technique, measuring otoacoustic emissions, is a way for us to uh, measure the functionality of the outer hair cells inside the cochlea. Uh, sorry uh, that this is so blurry. This is a screenshot right from your text, and it shows um, a screenshot from an older piece of equipment that will measure transient evoked otoacoustic emissions. This is the stimulus right here. This is the click measured in the ear. So it goes click, and then uh, right after the click, we're going to measure the sound over time. This is time on the x-axis here and here the sound coming back uh, into the ear canal. Uh, notice this waveform is very tightly, um, uh, you see these tight little excursions right here, and then it starts to become more broad. Well, this is reflect a reflection of the high frequency information and low frequency measure uh, information as we get this traveling wave down the basilar membrane from the uh, base to the apex. The, the measurements of amplitude of the sound are placed in two different memory banks and a comparison is made between the two memory banks and if the two memory banks show very similar waveforms we're going to say that the the, uh, the the response in the ear canal is very reproducible and we're going to measure reproducibility in percent so over in this it's hard to see here but each each of these little areas right here on this section of, of the uh, graph uh, or window represents different frequency regions. This is right around 700 hertz. This is about 1500 hertz. This is, what is that? It's hard for me to see that, what that is. That's about maybe 2000 hertz, 3000 hertz. This is closer to, I think this is 5.7 hertz if I remember. Anyway, you see these percentages. These percentages show us that uh, the two waveforms are highly reproducible. If they're highly reproducible, we're going to buy into the idea that O2 acoustic emissions exist. Uh, if all these values here were 0%, then we would say no O2 acoustic emissions were measured. So if the ear canal and the middle ear are within normal limits, there's no fluid in the middle ear, there's no wax in the external ear canal, and if we saw zeros across uh, for the values in this measurement over here of reproducibility of the two waveforms, then we would assume that the uh, outer hair cells are not functioning. Okay, uh, again, the amount of reproducibility between the two tracings across frequencies is right here. For relatively high correlations, let's say around greater than 80%, we will assume that the OAEs are present. Uh, and this is a breakdown of the OAEs uh, reproducibility by frequency in kilohertz uh, for 700, 1500, 2000, 3,000 and 5,000 hertz. Uh, Bright and Kastner Wells did this really interesting study. The authors measured the re reproducibility of transient evoked OAEs for TEOAEs, uh, or TEOAEs for two groups of subjects with normal audiograms. One group reported no history of exposure to loud sounds. The second group reported a history of exposure to loud sounds. And what these authors did was they measured the reproducibility across these frequency bands for two groups of subjects. Both subjects had normal audiograms. One group reported no history of exposure to loud sounds. The second group reported a history of exposure to loud sounds. Here is uh, a graph that I created from their data. Here is the uh, here's reproducibility, and here are the uh, different uh, frequency bands for the OAEs. This is the group without a history of noise exposure. Again, both groups have normal audiograms. This is the group. This is the data from uh, from a group of individuals with normal audiograms and some history of exposure to, to, to high level sounds. So, what can we tell about the reproducibility? Again, reproducibility is a reflection of the presence of otoacoustic emissions, and we can see that we have. It looks like we have decreased functionality 
of the outer hair cells in the high frequency region of the basilar membrane. Uh, these are average measures. So this is this is on average. Uh, this is the the reproducibility on average for each of these frequency bands. So we, the overall story is. Uh, we can have individuals with normal audiograms, but a history of noise who have a history of noise exposure, uh, they have reduced outer hair cell function, even though it's not reflected. It is not reflected in a normal audiogram. So the question is, with a normal audiogram, what do we know about outer hair cell function? Well, uh, we actually don't know anything unless we actually measure it with something like a TEOAE or perhaps a DP distortion product autoacoustic emissions. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, Bright and Kessner Wells, the re uh, in the results, uh, they had results that showed that the group with uh, normal audiograms and a history of exposure to loud sounds or high level sounds had poorer OAE reproducibility for the high frequency outer hair cells. In other words, the audiogram was not sensitive enough to show the early stages of decreased outer hair cell function due to exposure to high level sounds. Okay, now distortion product autoacoustic emissions. Distortion products can be generated due to the non-linearity of the system. Uh, all that means is what goes in is not what comes out. Uh, distortion is an undesired change in the acoustic signal from input to output. Non-linear means uh, disproportionate, out of proportion, as in size, shape, or amount in cause and effect. So the signal going in is not the signal going out of the system. Uh, this is the signal going in. Two pure tones go into the ear canal. When two pure tones where the frequency for the first tone is lower than the frequency for the second tone are simultaneously presented to a human ear, the most prominent distortion product occurs at a frequency equal to 2F1 minus F2. This is called the cubic difference tone or DPOAE, distortion product, autoacoustic emission. So the sound going into the ear is not the same as the sound coming out of the ear. Uh, F1 and F2 are called the primary tones. Again, these are pure tones. 2F1 minus F2 is the distortion product tone that is generated in the cochleus. So for example, if F1 equals 1000 hertz and F2 equals 1200 hertz, then 2 F1 or 2 times F1 minus F2 will equal 800 hertz. So we're going to look for distortion product autoacoustic emission at 800 hertz. In other words, we're going to measure the amplitude in the 800 hertz region of the sound coming out of the ear. Uh, Giuseppe Tartini, the 18th century violinist and composer, uh, was the first to remark that the pitch 2F1 minus F2 could be heard when two notes are played simultaneously, even though that frequency is absent in the sound waves. Well, that's really interesting. 18th century violinist and, com and composer uh, was the first to remark that this pitch could be heard when two notes are played simultaneously. So, for example, if you simultaneously play the notes C and E on the A and E strings of a violin, an individual with healthy ears uh, can hear the note G. And that's exactly what happened. He was writing music that had these uh, these passages where the violinist would play uh, two strings together and they played two notes and they heard that the violinist actually heard this third tone. So they're playing the music and they're looking around, wait a minute, where did the third note come from? You know, and, and that was actually coming from their outer hair cells. So this was actually reported way, way, way back, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, by Tartini. They were called Tartini tones. The note G is called a Tartini tone, or a cubic distortion product, or a distortion product autoacoustic emission. Here's a screenshot from a piece of equipment that uh, measures distortion product autoacoustic emissions. These, this, uh, this is a screenshot of the sound amplitude in the ear canal. This is uh, the x-axis represents frequency, and the y-axis represents amplitude in dB SPL. So here's F1, here's F2. So two times F1 minus F2 will give you this frequency of 2109 hertz, and we we're measuring the amplitude at, at 2109 hertz 
and it happens to be 9 dB. We take this 9 dB for, for this uh, around 2,000 hertz, and we plot it over here. So this is the, uh, the DPOAE amplitude. Okay, actually, uh, F, so in, for the details, F1 is uh, 2,625 hertz, F2 is 3,141 hertz. And we're going to measure this distortion product autoacoustic emission over here. Okay, so when uh, this says 2,625 hertz, that's that's where the x value comes here. And then, so we're not plotting this at the same frequency as the DPOE. We're actually plotting it at the uh, frequency for F1. And then we'll take two other tones. Uh, we'll increase the frequency or decrease the frequency. And then measure F, F1 again. So we're increasing the uh, F1, F2 frequencies, or we're decreasing it, and we're measuring the amplitude of the DPOAE. And this way, we can determine the functionality of outer hair cells across uh, various frequency regions of the basilar membrane. Okay, for most, uh, here's, here's a study uh, that we presented around 2007. Um, the the x-axis represents something called the Hint Composite Score. All that means is it's a measure of the ability to recognize speech and noise. This is a very good score for hearing and noise ability, or speech recognition and noise ability. This is a very poor score. Uh, this is the average high frequency amplitude in DPSPL. Uh, this would represent a highly functioning outer hair cells. This is uh, poorly functioning outer hair cells. We're taking the average of the amplitude across uh, the, the high frequency region of the basilar membrane. And we can see a relative, uh, relatively linear relationship, as we call it. So the better functioning the outer hair cells, the uh, better the hearing and noise ability. And the poorer functioning the outer hair cells, the poorer the hearing and noise ability. So for most subjects with normal audiograms, there appears to be a relationship between outer hair cell function and the ability to recognize speech and background noise. The 2F1 F, uh, minus F2 DPOAE is largest when the ratio of F1 to F2 is equal to about 1.22. And the levels of F1 and F2 are 65 and 50 dB SPL respectively. DPOAEs are measured during cochlear activation, unlike TEOAEs, which are measured after cochlear activation. Generally, the DPOAE amplitude should be at least 5 to 6 dB above the noise floor. Okay, auditory brainstem response. The ABR uh, was first reported by Jewett and colleagues in 1970, and Sommer and Feinmeiser in 1967. The ABR is one of a series of auditory evoked responses. Again, that word evoked, we're going to play a sound and then measure what comes back, uh, this time not in the ear canal, but through electrodes. So th we're going to evoke auditory responses that can be measured from neural, the neural pathways of the auditory system using small disc electrodes placed on the surface of the head and on the mastoids bones. A signal, a signal averaging computer averages the synchronous neural responses which are generated as electrical potentials that can be measured on the scalp. Synchronous just means this. Here's a click. Here's an electrical response. Here's a click. Here's an electrical response. So that it's, it's a synchronous response. So uh, ABRs are done on uh, from infants through adults. And uh, here's a little guy ready for his ABR. Uh, here's some electrodes, a little electrode on the forehead, and an electrode behind each mastoid. And then we have a tiny little insert phone going inside the ear canal of this, this child. A click will be delivered into the ear, and then we'll measure the responses or the electrical activity in response to sound as it goes through the neural pathways in the, uh, uh, in the auditory system from the eighth nerve through the, the brain stem. That's why it's called the brain stem response. We're actually not measuring electrical activity in the brain, or at least we're not trying to. Okay, we're measuring the electrical activity from the eighth nerve through the auditory brain stem uh, pathways. 
To achieve neural synchrony, the ABR requires the use of brief acoustic signals called transients or clicks that have a rapid onset time and a broadband frequency response. The computer measures the electrical activity from the electrodes for a short time period after each stimulus is delivered. When the ABR recording is averaged over a large number of stimuli, say 2,000 clicks, the synchronous ABR response is enhanced and the random or asynchronous background electrical activity, also known as the EEG or electroencephalogram, also known as electrical noise, is reduced. Because the auditory brainstem responses are quite small or low in level or amplitude, successful recording requires that the patient be still or even asleep. Uh, there's two purposes for measuring the auditory brainstem response. The first one uh, is, is when we use the ABR to estimate pure tone thresholds. This is not a direct measure of the pure tone threshold. This is only an estimate of what the threshold might be if the everything is functioning within normal limits within the cortex. And we can use a click or we can use something called a tone burst or a tone pip uh, in order to determine uh, the, or, or in order to estimate pure tone thresholds across the, the frequency regions of the basilar membrane in the auditory system. The ABR is also used to determine the presence of eighth nerve disorders. The latency of the normal ABR is within 2 to 10 milliseconds after stimulation by a click. The ABR is characterized by a series of 6 to 7 waves or bumps. Uh, the x-axis represents time or latency, the y-axis represents voltage, and so imagine here's a click and now uh, all of a sudden we get this little surge in electrical activity as, uh, as, as picked up by the electrodes on the head uh, and then the elect electrical activity goes down and then all of a sudden it hits another structure, it goes up, it goes down, it hits another structure, it goes up, it might run into like several structures at once and then it goes up and then down, etc. Okay, so this is a very typical auditory brainstem response. Notice that we see this normal ABR within the first 10 milliseconds, though if we had a pro problem in the cochlea or in the, the auditory neural pathways, uh, we can have a delayed ABR. Uh, and just to let you know, if you, if you had fluid in the middle ear, that could del delay the ABR because that will decrease the level of the click. And the lower the level of the click, the longer the latency of the ABR, so that can shift things out in this direction. Uh, memorize this. According to Moeller, 1994, he thought the different bumps of the ABR were from these, uh, uh, these sites. Wave 1 from the distal portion of the eighth nerve, or the farthest part of the eighth nerve away from the brain. Wave 2, the proximal portion of the 8th nerve, or the part of the 8th nerve closest to the brain. Uh, wave 3, from the cochlear nucleus. Wave 4, from the superior olivary complex. Wave 5, from the lateral lemniscus, and input to the inferior colliculus. So go ahead and measure this, I mean, uh, memorize this. ABR latencies are affected by peripheral hearing disorders. Wave 5 is the most prominent positive deflection in, in the ABR waveform and is the wave most often used for clinical assessment of the ABR threshold because it is the only peak present near threshold. Uh, here is the uh, ABR uh, in response to clicks and what we see here is when the click is at 75 dB and HL means normalized HL we see this the characteristic waveform and then at 60 dB we start to see the waveform uh, increase in latency. So this is an increase in latency. If it went this way, it would be a decrease in latency. And we see that two things happen. When the test sound is decreased in latency, we see a decrease in amplitude of the ABR. We also see that the early waveforms actually disappear. We can't see them anymore. And we see that wave 5 starts to increase in latency. So a decrease in amplitude increase in latency when the level of the click or the stimulus is decreased. Again, we could, we could get this uh, in effect by uh, filling the middle ear with fluid. Once the middle ear is filled with fluid, the click going into the middle or going through the auditory system will be decreased in amplitude. 
same if we had uh, wax uh, that completely blocked the ear canal. That would be the same thing. Notice that there are actually two tracings of the ABR. We do this one time, we do this two times, and then we compare the waveforms. If the waveforms are re reproducible, then we then we uh, believe that the the uh, auditory brainstem pathways are responding. Okay, if the tracings are not repeatable, like look over here, where where is wave one? Well, it would be around here someplace, but we don't see the reproducibility of wave one. See, this is reproducible, this is reproducible. What about wave three? Is this wave three? Yeah, well, that could have been wave three, but we also see this bump over here. They aren't re reproducible. You want to see the bumps right on top of each other. There could be a little bit of a difference in in, in um, voltage. That's okay. But the time has to be identical. So we don't see reproducible waveforms here or here. We only see reproducible waveforms here for wave 5. And is this a wave 5 here? Eh, I don't know. That might be a little questionable, I think. But anyway, the author of the, the, um, the text indicates that that is a wave 5. Collect evoked ABR thresholds are an estimate within 10 to 15 dB of the degree of pure tone threshold in the 2,000 to 4,000 hertz region, according to Bosch and Olson. So we can actually use click evoked, or we can use tone burst uh, evoked, or tone pip evoked, uh, autoacoustic emissions, to try to get some frequency specific information. And again, this is an estimation of the pure tone threshold. The ABR can also be used to identify possible eighth nerve pathologies. When evaluating eighth nerve or brainstem function, the ABR is recorded at a relatively high stimulus level in both ears. So both ears would, would receive a click or a tone pip or a tone burst at exactly the same level. And then you measure the, the latency of waves 1, 2, and, and 5. And for a patient with an eighth nerve pathology, uh, we may find a difference in wave 5 latency between the two ears. This is called the interaural latency difference. Okay, so measure wave 5 in one ear, let's say it's 5.6 milliseconds. Wave, measure wave 5 in the other ear, let's say it's 9 milliseconds. Wow, that's a huge difference in latency. Something must be wrong. Is there wax in, in one of the ears? No. Is there fluid in the other ear? No. What could, what could slow down the signal getting to the, um, getting to the auditory neural pathways? Well, one of the things that can occur is well, two things. You could have damage in the cochlea, or if it's not related to damage in the cochlea, it could be the presence of an acoustic neuroma or a vestibular schwannoma on the eighth nerve, or a tumor on another uh, spot on, on the brainstem. Uh, let's let's look at this little study. This is a quick review of cochlear mechanics from an auditory brainstem and high pass masking study. Uh, that I did. It's an unpublished master's thesis. Dr. Beatty was my advisor at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, and recall, we have something called the traveling wave. So the stapes foot plate vibrates, and then the sound travels from the high frequency region of the basilar membrane to the middle frequencies to the low frequency region of the basilar membrane. So imagine p placing high pass, high pass uh, masking noise inside the cochlea. So we're going to block off with noise. We're going to mask uh, different regions in, in the high-frequency portion of the basilar membrane. Okay? And when we enter in this noise, so we might have a high-pass noise that is just masking the very high-frequency portion of the basilar membrane. It'll sound something like And then imagine uh, more noise where we're masking a greater portion of the high-frequency region of the basilar membrane. It sounds closer to Right? So uh, we did this and went through a specialized filter to get these uh, configurations of the noise. This is when the cut uh, frequency of the, of the high pass masking noise was at 10,000 hertz. And then I took one patient or, or one research subject and measured her audiogram. Then I, I changed the frequency of the, cut, the, of, the, of the cutoff frequency for the high pass masking to a lower frequency. Uh, this was when the noise. Uh, above 8,000 hertz was being allowed to go into the ear, then this was the audiogram. And then when I dropped the frequency again, this was the audiogram. So you can see what we're doing here. We're simulating 
a high frequency hearing loss with the masking noise. So this is the audiograms for one research subject. So we played the noise and measured all these frequencies for the pure tone thresholds. We played the, a different noise and we measured the pure tone thresholds. Played a different noise, measured all the pure tone thresholds. That's how we obtain these, these different audiograms. Uh, so audiograms for one research subject for each of the high pass masking conditions. The high pass maskers created a simulated high frequency hearing loss. And here are the auditory brainstem responses for one subject with a normal audiogram without any masking noise. So that's that typical ABR. And then 10,000 hertz high pass masking noise, 8,000, 6,000, 4,000. And you see what's happening to the ABR. It's actually the amplitude is decreasing and the latency is extending. So there's two ways to extend the latency and decrease the amplitude of the ABR. One is to decrease the signal. Uh, the other is to decrease the region of the, uh, the frequency region of the basilar membrane that's being stimulated. Okay, why do we have this shift in latency? Why does it take, why is this latency uh, later than this latency? Well, the, region, the reason is, is this is a reflection of the high frequency uh, portion of the basilar membrane. When we block out the high frequencies in the basilar membrane with that high pass masking noise, we now have to wait for the signal to get to a lower frequency region of the basilar membrane in order to stir, stimulate the, uh, the, nerve, the neurons uh, that go up the eighth nerve and up to the brain stem. So that's, that's why you see this shift in latency as we stimulate, uh, the, as the stimulus is focused on more lower, frequencies, reg, lower, lower frequency regions of the basilar membrane. This is a reflection of the traveling wave in the cochlea. This is to rarefaction clicks, which means that the, uh, that the diaphragm of the earphone moves away from the uh, ear canal and for the click, click in the diaphragm is moving away from the ear canal or moving away from the tympanic membrane. This is for a condensation click when the diaphragm of the click is moving towards the TM. So click and the diaphragm moves quickly towards the TM and then back to its resting position. Uh, this DP, you don't really have to know about this. This is just the difference potential where we subtract these uh, these two waveforms. Okay, when an ABR is collected as the cutoff frequency of the high pass masker is decreased, the latency of the ABR waves are increased. This indicates that the neural signal responsible for the generation of the ABR is from progressively lower frequency regions of the cochlea. This is similar to how a high frequency hearing loss may affect the latency of the ABR. And that wraps up our lecture on autoacoustic emissions and the ABR. Don't forget, uh, none of these tests are hearing tests. These are tests of various uh, uh, aspects of the auditory system. So if a nurse walks into a newborn nursery and tells the new parents, okay, now is the time for your, your baby's hearing test and administers autoacoustic emissions, it's not really a hearing test. It's a test of the functionality of the outer hair cells in the cochlea. Of course, the technician probably won't say that. Uh, same, uh, they can also do an ABR test with an infant, a newborn, and, and the technician might say this is a hearing test. Well, it's not really a hearing test. It's a measure of the functionality of the neural pathways from the eighth nerve through the brainstem, uh, provided that the, uh, the, outer, uh, the outer ear canal, the external ear canal and the middle ear are, are functioning within normal limits. Okay, and that's, that's it.